Moving on, I think it's good to know where we came from in order to know where we're going. So I wanna give you a little bit of the history of the 4-H program. 4-H started um, in 1902, if you ask most people. People will say that it started in um, Iowa, if they're from Iowa. If they're from Ohio, they say it started in Ohio. Here in Wisconsin, it started in Walworth County, so not too far away from us um, in Walworth. Their club is still around over 101 years, going strong. 4-H started in rural areas as corn clubs and canning clubs. So what happened was the 4-H agent, like me, they were actually called extension agents back then. They were out looking for ways to take um, the idea of hybrid corn that the university had developed and share it with the farmers in the area. Well, farmers were having nothing to do with hybrid corn, kind of a weird concept they thought being new and different. They didn't want to really take hold of hybrid corn and run with it. So the extension agent thought, hey, I'm going to try things out with these kids and see what happens. Well, for those of you who are farming, you know that hybrid corn is going to be way better than the seeds you're going to get from the corn, your corn crop the year before. And these kids produced way more corn than their parents did. Well, that was a great way to get, they found out that a great way to educate people was through young people because they were much more accepting of new things or different things. And we started 4-H corn clubs with boys. It took us a while to add girls, but girls were added later with 4-H canning clubs. The same concept, taking canning practices that were working really well at the university and teaching them to young people to make sure we're creating a fresher product, a safer product, and a product that won't spoil as well. Of course, as you know, 4-H has gone a long way in 100 years. Our kids right now are in robotics and science-related activities. We're not just growing corn and canning vegetables, although those are very important things in our program. There definitely are lots of other things that your kids can do. So you don't have to live on a farm. Um, you don't have to be involved with agriculture. You don't have to own an animal. You can still do lots of cool 4-H stuff, which we'll get to later in this presentation. 4-H is also part of the University of Wisconsin system. So I'm an employee of the University of Wisconsin. Um, 4-H is based out of the land-grant university in the state that it is in. So depending on what state you go to will depend on what university 4-H is a part of, um, which also means that we get our funding from lots of different places. And I think I'll discuss a little bit later to help you understand how that all works. So we're called University of Wisconsin Extension. We're an extension of the university, bringing things that are happening um, at a research-based level to you throughout the county. So here's the funding source. It's kind of an interesting thing. We're funded at four different levels. We're funded nationally by the Farm Bill and the USDA. We're funded at the state level by the university system. Your county tax dollars helps to pay for some of what we do. And of course, with our 4-H program, we get lots of local funding with your dues you pay or fundraisers that we do. I always like to tell people about our funding source because you'll find that sometimes there's rules in 4-H that make absolutely no sense to you. Well, I'm sad to say that sometimes they don't even make sense to me. A lot of what we do is driven by where our funding comes from. And so you may see rules or things we have to report or things we ask you for that may not seem pertinent to you or to our 4-H program locally, but there's definitely a reason behind what we do. It also means that every state, every county, and every local 4-H club is really different. So if you have friends in Dodge or Waukesha County and they're talking about a program they're doing or a deadline that's coming up, be sure to check here in our county to make sure that it's something that pertains to what we're doing here, not to um, just their county. Also, your local 4-H club is going to do things differently than maybe the other local 4-H club. You may have extra things they do. They may choose not to do certain things. Of course, if it's a county program, it's open to all of you, but just know that there's going to be differences that you'll find in the 4-H program, even within Jefferson County. So let's talk a little bit about popular projects. So far this year in 4-H, youth are enrolled in 3,579 different project areas. If you look here, I listed some of the top projects, and I do that because I think people have a misconception that 4-H is about, or that 4-H is about agriculture. If you look here, poultry, swine, horses, they're ag-related, but really if you look at our top projects, they have absolutely nothing to do with, with agriculture. Photography currently has the most youth enrolled, with 299 kids enrolled in photography. Arts and crafts, 254. Foods and nutrition, that's going to include cake decorating and canning, 188. Archery with 173. I think people are always shocked by that one, not thinking that archery is a 4-H thing. Then we have poultry, 170, swine, 137, and horses, 129. I think this is good to know to know that there are so many options out there for your kids. Even if you are in swine, you could also do arts and crafts and photography. 
Um, we don't limit the number of projects you can take, but know that every project requires your time and dedication. So be careful not to overextend yourself, especially in the first couple years. The facts about 4-H here in Jefferson County, um, we currently have about 733 youth. It's growing every day. Your kids are hopefully one of that number, and they're involved in 4-H clubs throughout the county. Currently, we have 279 volunteers. Those are people that help the 4-H program out. It's super easy to become a volunteer, and if you're interested in that, please let me know. Please know that if you do want to drive other kids around or help with do things with other kids, we'd really prefer that you're a volunteer and that we're following safe practices. So please plan to attend a training. There's no cost for it, and it really is only about 40 minutes to an hour of your time. We currently have 29 clubs in Jefferson County, and those clubs are located throughout the county. Most of them you join because of your geographic location, but you also might join a club based on some of the projects they offer. We have one club that does pretty much strictly horse-related items, so if you're showing beef and you don't really know anything about horses, that might not be the club for you. We also have a couple of clubs um, that meet in the same location, so you kind of choose based on if your friends are in it or things like that. I always like to tell people that 4-H clubs are like shoes. You want to try some on and make sure you find the right fit for you and your family. So your 4-H club is where it all starts. A club is a mix of families, leaders, and members. And those little asterisks means that there's a, there's a handout that goes with this. So if you want to open up your handout, um, there is um, a white handout called How a Business Meeting Works. And I just want you to know what that business meeting is, because sometimes people show up to 4-H club meetings and they think, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? What's happening here? This kind of goes to the things that are probably going to happen at your meeting. Note that everything on here will not happen at every club meeting, but everything on here may happen at your meeting. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the different things are that are happening at each meeting. Clubs should hopefully do some community service, helping out your community in some way. Um, some kind of fundraising, probably. As a county, we do a pizza and pie fundraiser every August to September. It's our main source of money and how we pay for events that we do or, or scholarships or camps or things like that. So please plan to participate in that fundraiser next year when it comes around. Um, we do make a pretty good profit off of that. And your club also makes money through our fundraising efforts. We're hoping that clubs are doing social events, getting together, having fun, going to parades, having parties, things like that. And for me, most importantly, we hope our clubs are doing life skill development. When you show up to your club meeting, you may think, what is this thing that they're doing where they say, I make a motion or I move or and they vote? It's called parliamentary procedure. And attached to your business meeting, how business meeting works, there's two parliamentary procedure cards. Those are for you to take with your kids, put them in your pocket. They're going to talk a little bit about how um, to make a motion at a meeting if your kid wants to help or vote or why we make motions and how you can vote on different things. It's just kind of a good thing to have to real simple and easy to take with you. Also at clubs, we're making decisions about what we're going to do. We're doing teamwork activities. We're doing demonstrations and hopefully more fun things too. Demonstrations are a really important way for young people to talk and tell about what they're doing in the program. So I also included some demonstration type information in your packet. So you'll see that there is a let's demonstrate and a demonstration worksheet in your packet. They would be on the golden rod and kind of a buff colored um, paper. If you look at the back of the buff one, there's actually a worksheet where your child can write down exactly what they're going to say during the demonstration. If your club currently isn't doing demonstrations, maybe volunteer to be the first one to do one and talk about them. Um, your kid can talk about something that really interests them, maybe a hobby they have or a dance or a sports procedure they do. Something that they enjoy doing, they can tell other people about it. Maybe like a show and tell would kind of be a good way to put that. And if you have any questions about that or your club leader wants to talk to me more about demonstrations because you're not currently doing them, feel free to give me a call or invite me out and I'd love to do some um, demonstration work with your 4-H club. Okay, next we're going to talk about who's in your 4-H club. So a club is made up of lots of different people. First, there are officers. Usually in your meeting, those are going to be the people sitting in front. There's usually a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Um, those offices, basically, the president runs your meeting, the vice president helps them, the secretary keeps a note of what's going on, and the treasurer keeps the money. These should be young people um, in the club. We have some clubs of really young members that don't always have the ability to have all those offices filled by kids, but the program itself what we do in 4-H should be run by young people, not by adults. Then, of course, we have members. Those are your kids. 
members make decisions, maybe like where they're going to go on a trip, what kind of community service, how they're going to spend their money, what kind of things they want to do. And that's what they're going to do during the meeting. Then we have Clover Buds, which is kind of like a 4-H member, but not quite there yet. Our Clover Buds are our youth in grades kindergarten through second grade. And as parents know, um, our attention span for kindergartners to second grade is pretty short. So club meetings may be really hard for this age. I would suggest if it's not happening in your club already to really think about having the Clover Buds meet separately from the club. So usually what happens is everybody shows up at a meeting and then you do roll call, you do your pledges, and then usually the Clover Buds are dismissed and another parent or leader takes them and does some activity with them. The issue comes in here where you don't always have parents volunteering to take on that role. So that might be a great place for you to, to say, hey, I might do that, or an older member. So during that, the, they plan activities, they do some things that this age group is good at. We have great curriculum or great lesson plans to help you with that. And then usually at the end of the meeting, the Clover Buds come back, and they talk about what they did or what they made. It's a great way for them to do some public speaking um, and to show other members what they're working on. If you don't have a separate Clover Bud meeting, that's okay. Your Clover Buds mate can just get involved with the regular club stuff. There are some restrictions to what they can do. They can't do any type of livestock or animal projects um, unless they do that in open class format at the fair. Um, they can't show horses and they can't shoot any kind of um, shooting sports projects. Some countywide project leaders may allow them to come to meetings and some may not. You'll want to check with the project that you're interested in getting them involved in. Then we have leaders. So there's different kinds of leaders. So you should have a club leader. That's like the person in charge of your 4-H club. I correspond with them. They correspond with me. Anytime I have information, I send it to them and they, they're going to send it back to me. Then you have project leaders. So some clubs have very few project leaders and some clubs have lots of project leaders. It just depends on your 4-H club. A project leader is someone who's going to lead a specific project area like arts and crafts, photography, woodworking. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the different kinds of leaders in a couple of more slides. Then we have an activity leader. This is the person who says, you know, listen, I'm not very good at woodworking. I can't lead a project, but I want to help in any way that I can. So these people may lead a community service, um, get programs like people to come to your club and talk, maybe in charge of fundraising. They may just be there to do snacks every time or drive kids around. So that's a really easy way to get involved. So hopefully you'll think about maybe becoming an activity leader within your 4-H club. So if being a leader just isn't for you, of course, our club is also make up, made up of parents. Parents, please attend meetings with your kids so you know what's going on. We're not a babysitting club. Um, I used to work for the Girl Scouts. That's what makes them a little bit different than us. A lot of times Girl Scouts meet with just the troop and the two leaders. We really are a family organization. We want the parents there during the meetings. Please don't sit and talk in the back of the room. Sit next to your kids. Help them stay focused um, and help them focus on the meeting. Maybe you might be asked to provide snacks or any assistance. So if you could do that, that'd be great. And of course, we want you to become a leader. So think about helping with a project or an activity and watch the newsletter for um, when you can come to a training to become a leader.